Hi, everybody. This is Matthew Pose with Audioholics, and I'm here with Don Dunn. What's up, everybody? <laughs> I have a special guest with us. Edgar, you know, I don't want a chance uh, messing up your last name. How do you pronounce your last name before I... Uh, um, no. Usually Shuari, but I, I'll take any Shuari. pronunciation. Any sure. pronunciation. With, with, with four vowels in a row, I you have to get used to uh, all kinds of distortion. <laughs> it rolls off the tongue. <laughs> yeah, I can... Under, you know, I have... So I have a very short it's four letters, P-O-E-S, yeah. and it gets pronounced every possible way, but the correct one usually. <laughs> So, um, all right, well, Edgar, uh, I really appreciate having you on here. You are a professor at the University of, well, you were at Princeton University, I should say, not University of, of. and mm -hmm. um, uh, Don was, was joking earlier that you are a uh, rocket scientist, which is technically true, but we didn't bring you on here to talk about rockets, did we? We brought you on here to talk about something else. So why don't you introduce yourself, let everybody know who you are, a little bit about what you do, but we're gonna, of course, let you give your presentation in a minute. Yes, I'm, I'm um, uh, trained as a physicist, and I, my training is in plasma physics and uh, applied to uh, spacecraft propulsion. I run a research lab for many years, more, more like 30 years now, uh, in that field. Um, uh, and, uh, but since I was quite young, I'm, um, I'm a frustrated musician. I'm not a good musician. I married a good one, and I <laughs> related to some good ones, but I'm not a good musician. So my way of getting close to music was to record musicians and especially of course record orchestras so for a long time i've recorded school orchestras university orchestra my university orchestra um a few years a few years ago i got the honor of recording my favorite orchestra in the world the berlin philharmonic uh, so it's more of a hobby initially but then it led me to realize that when i come home and listen to my recordings they're never realistic uh, so the realism fascinated me for a long time I started working on it, got lucky here and there. Uh, when you work in university, you're surrounded by very smart young people. I gathered a few around me, put a lab together, got some funding. And now since 2007, I have a research laboratory where we work on, it's called the 3D Audio and Applied Acoustics Laboratory. Produced um, quite a few publications, few patents. Uh, we have been funded by Sony, by Tesla, and by Focal, currently by Tesla and Focal. Uh, and we produce, um, you know, we work on uh, spatial audio mostly, which I'll get to talk, I hope, a little bit about later on. Um, and um, it's all driven by my love of and um, passion to try to produce music correctly, although a lot of research we do um, is on uh, augmented reality and virtual reality audio. And I believe a lot of these advances, as I will describe soon, I hope, uh, translate into, uh, I, well, at least I hope they would translate into... Um, uh, uh, technology that would enhance music listening at home. So my connection with you here is music listening at home. Um, most of my research have to do with uh, spatial audio uh, for um, applications like, um, as I said, uh, AR, VR, as we call it, augmented reality, virtual reality. And one of my passion is to see how the findings that are happening right now, very quickly in this field, can be brought into the traditional consumer audio, hi-fi audio, high-end audio, as, as you want to call it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, um, for those of you who don't know, um, I've given uh, talks on, on YouTube before about the importance of spatial audio for accurately reproducing these musical events in a way that sounds believable, accurate being to that real event. Um, and Edgar, you and I were talking a lot about this, this the acoustic music like classical music, uh, symphonies are the, are the classic example of a real event that you have some point of reference to compare against. So yeah, you're here to talk about basically how that works. And um, you know, I've done my best in the past, but I don't have your experience. And so I'm really excited to have you here yeah. to be able to talk about that. Me so, too, thank you uh, very much for having me on the show. So I'm excited to talk. I'm a bit out of my water here. Usually I'm at a conference with a bunch of nerds like me and my graduate students. So here uh, you among the people of my hobby, so to speak, uh, whom I, um, you know, the idea of- And a hillbilly. Uh, and hell, Billy. <laughs> Don, give yourself more credit. All right. Well, well, uh, Edgar, why don't you go ahead and pull your slides up, and I'll put them up on the screen, and we can go ahead and get started talking about that. We are really excited to hear about this. Um, and you know, for those of you who are listening, this is going to be a really good opportunity for you to start to better understand basically how we hear th these li live musical events, what makes them sound real to us, and basically what we're able to do. Uh, in a home to recreate that. Um, but also I think importantly to start to understand what happens in a home uh, with typical reproduction systems like stereo systems and surround systems that actually fail to accurately reproduce this. So 
Uh, Edgar, I'm still seeing your, I think your- Yeah, I, I, I'll be using my slides. Uh, I'm, uh, since I'm not at a conference, I'm really enjoying myself with a relaxed interview. I'll be using the slides when I need them uh, to illustrate some points. I haven't prepared a structured talk like would happen at an academic conference. And this is why I'm planning to enjoy this. Um, oh, great. We let, our, we let our hair down on this show. That's great. why I'm So great. just relax, I'm, I'm, have, will, a, have some wine. <laughs> uh, I will dig in, in the slides when I need them. But um, just to, as an introduction, I think the theme that you uh, outlined to me in our earlier conversations uh, is about realism in audio. And um, mm -hmm. uh, I'll come back to that because we already hinted at the... the um, idea of uh, classical music or acoustically recorded music uh, i know very well that's uh, this is a very small percentage of the music industry output and what people listen to, to, to today uh, however it does hold uh, as a benchmark as i will describe in a minute because if you can uh, if you have the tools to reproduce uh, recorded acoustic music very correctly very accurately and realistically that's the right word for the the theme of our conversation today uh, one could use them for other types of music and for uh, constructed music, so to speak. In other words, most of the rock, pop, you know, folk music today, pretty much, uh, I would say, a huge percentage, if not 95, 98%, I haven't done the study, uh, are recorded not acoustically, purely in, a, in an environment. But uh, um, we'll use the acoustic uh, model as, um, as a kind of litmus test you know, uh, for the tools that give us the realism. These tools can then be used for constructed music. We'll talk about that later on. But first, I want to say something important about how things are evolving right now. Uh, many people in the pro audio, commercial audio, and hi-fi audio field uh, have their own traditions, their own you know, uh, beliefs, and so on. Um, there is a parallel world. Uh, quite unknown, I'm surprised, to many people in that field. And I consider myself a bit in both fields, of course. I work in the lab. I go to the conferences. But I also am a hobbyist. I go to every year to the Munich show, uh, especially now that I have, I'm involved with two companies that do high-end audio, including my own company, Theoretical Applied Physics. So we go to these to this, um, shows, and I know what's out there. I know how to turn a turntable. I know I have tape machines. I have amps and so on. So uh, I know that your group are in that, in that world. I should tell this group that there is another world going on out there. In the past 10 years, especially the past five years, have been really revolutionary. There are really revolutions happening in audio. Mostly not by traditional, what you think traditional amplifier designers, companies who work on preamps and DACs and so on. These are mostly young kids. Many of them do not even own speakers, like my graduate students. These are young kids, very bright young kids around the world, from all nationalities, literally around the world today. You're going from China, India, all over Europe, uh, and, and the US. As a matter of fact, Europe has been leading uh, initially in this field, uh, China is catching up very quickly. Um, the US is a bit behind Europe in terms of number of laboratories and number of patents in this field. Europeans, for some reason, took on the spatial aspect of audio quickly, but the US is catching up uh, very quickly already. But just aside from that, this is a field in which the goal is realism. The idea is to fool the listener that there is someone in, in the room with you. They're not they're not joking. They're, they, they're not trying to, you know, tweak uh, jitter or, you know, uh, get some flat or fixed response. As a matter of fact, as I'll show you later on and argue later on, they don't even care about these things because they found out they're not as important to realism, to pure realism. So their goal is really, really tough. Is to, for example, put a put a, a an AR or VR. The difference between AR AR is like glasses. I have I have one pair right here. Uh, AR would you put like transparent glasses on your head like this, and you can I can still see you, but then I can conjure up um, somebody to sit right here in the room and I can see them. And the video is pretty effective. The challenge is how to make you believe that that person is in the room speaking to you at that place. That is, um, in some ways, that is directly related to the holy grail of hi-fi to have you believe that you are in a venue or someone with you. Now, if you put these transparent glasses, you have the paradigm of someone in, uh, uh, transporting someone in your own environment. And you, or if you put the, the, uh, the virtual reality glasses, which block you and project another world, then that's the goal there is, is to transport you to another venue. Quite often in music is to transport you to another venue. And so the VR is probably more, um, more relevant to music, but there are cases where 
the uh, AR model is uh, relevant to music too. Again, the goal is to make to fool you into believing that someone is realistically in the room with you, or to make you believe very accurately, well, to very effectively rather, that you are in some venue with people located in 3D space, not just flat in front of you or between two speakers. Uh, so that goal, as I said earlier, is the holy grail was the and still is the holy grail of hi-fi audio, hi-fi world. And it's ironic that um, there's not much many bridges between the two of us, partly because they're really separated. AR VR is driven by companies who are uh, developing tools for uh, tra teletransportation, telecommunications, uh, telepresence, a uh, very quickly rising field. And also it involves quite young people. I'm one of the older people I know in the field. And they're all young PhD students typically from around the world. I'm lucky to have with me in the lab, in the lab uh, one student from China, one student from India. We have quite a few American students also working on this fooling your brain into believing that an audio event is so real that you cannot distinguish it from reality. Now, they cannot distinguish it from reality has been old thing from audio, from the earliest days of audio. There is a great story about um, early, uh, about a, uh, the early uh, phono phonographic technique where there's a Carnegie Hall, there was a, a concert set up there um, in the early part of the century uh, with an Edison type uh, phonograph machine where they had a singer sing and they had a record playing and they let people in in the hall they played this and they let the singer stop and and people could not believe how realistic it is they were blown away if you read that record today by our standards you laugh so um the goal of realism is very old technologies um have been evolving in that direction but the last five years is an exponential growth there are conferences around the world uh three days ago there was a conference on three on 3d audio in, in bologna and italy of course it was it was done through uh, uh th through the internet because of the pandemic. Um, there's a regular conference every two years on AR, VR, audio. Uh, hundreds of people get together. And one of my passions is to see what can be taken from this AR, VR, uh, audio world and be, or uh, what can we learn from and apply to, to a home audio production and, home, and also recording techniques, uh, both acoustic recording techniques and mixing techniques. Okay. So that's, as I said, that's the goal. And I really want people to understand that uh, there is great optimism and great hope in improving quickly if people in the audio commercial audio world open their mind a little bit and uh, and 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 learn what these young people are 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 doing or breakthroughs almost on a daily basis okay so that's my introduction to a general theme that um that that, that bridge should be built quickly if one has to benefit at home aside from putting these goggles so that's setting the theme. Any questions about that uh, uh, that theme? I don't want to lecture too much uh, on that, but um, uh, any any questions, anything we should converse about? Uh, no questions have come up from the uh, the audience yet, but I think this is a great start. And I think, real, I mean, realism has definitely been the holy grail. And I think, Don, I mean, you hear that when people are buying equipment, they go out, they buy the best speakers, Somebody was making a, I think it was a serious comment, but it was a comment about whether, Edgar, whether you believe in high-end cables or not as a physicist. And I won't make you answer that, but. Um, it's like talking about your religion. Be, care be <laughs> careful. The religion, yeah. But the point is people do, they get into the, the speakers, the, their cables, their special amplifiers, and everything is about making it sound that much more real to them. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, listen, everybody hyper-focuses on the gear, but really when we're designing a system and we're meeting with a client, we talk about the experience, the re the realism, being drawn into a movie. Remember when we did that uh, that demo um, yesterday? It, it, you mean we, yesterday? We, yeah, all the way yesterday. We played two minutes of a clip, and we're like, "Oh, we were just getting into the movie." I mean, and that's what we have now. I can't wait to see what's coming. Well, and, and Edgar, you're going to talk about this, I know, and I think it's worth actually delving into it a little bit more. But what we have right now is still pretty it's pretty artificial, it's pretty 2D uh, by comparison to what's really possible. When I say what we have, not what the technology you're gonna talk about, but what we have in terms of mainstream stuff. We have stereo and we have surround and then within surround we have 
you know, there's the basic 5.1, like Dolby Digital and DTS systems, but then there were Atmos. advancements that came out, like Atmos, which people called 3D audio, but you've pointed out they're not really 3D. They're not capable of actually placing a person right here in my ear, That's which right. real That's 3D audio can do. If, if you go to a conference at the AES or um, any of the uh, international conferences on, on spatial, on audio in general, um, if you go to the academic or the scholarly or the, you know, high technical sessions, nobody calls surround sound uh, as we know it in the, in the living room, a 3D audio. Uh, now, the term has been hijacked by companies because people you know, relate to 3D and sounds good. But 3D audio, as you mentioned exactly, Matthew, uh, is the idea to put sound, uh, to perceive sound anywhere in principle in 3D, in 3D space, including whispering your ear. So it's very hard for a surround system uh, as, as the one you have typically in your living room for home theater to put sound at your ear or to put it inside your head or make it go up uh, and rotate around your head and come come through your head. Uh, although you don't have that control. It's not really 3D sound in the, in the academic or in the, scar in the, uh, in the, in the sci pure scientific sense. So the word 3D sound has been bandied about and uh, is acquired. Uh, but when you go to these conferences, nobody calls it that 3D sound. So we're talking about um, getting spatial or production correct. Now, Remember, I think we, that this talk is about realism, and why, why the question arises: Why are we talking so much about spatial audio when it is, the goal is realism? Now, I'm sure everybody has an opinion in, this, in the listeners of what in their system is so important for them to enjoy music. But we're not talking about pure enjoyment of music. Uh, I have, listen, by the way, I have a very good high-end system by many standards, but I find myself listening quite often when I'm working to a 1961 record player with a single tube inside the walls, <laughs> everything above, uh, above 13 kilohertz. And I enjoy the music. So music enjoyment is a very uh, complex thing that, um, so no one can claim, um, I'm gonna be telling them how to enjoy music or how, and this is a hobby, people enjoy their cable, they enjoy their, their turntable. We're not gonna talk about it. We're gonna talk about something very well defined, how you fool the brain into perceiving a sound field that's so realistic that is indistinguishable from a real sound field. Um, and by the way, don't let me fool you that this is already happening in, don't let me, I don't wanna imply that this is already happening in audio AR, VR. Uh, however, AR, VR, uh, you know, um, offers a lot of great solutions that can be adopted to improve spatial uh, uh, realism in home audio. For example, these very expensive um, uh, AR uh, goggles uh, called HoloLens, uh, they have, uh, two transducers that come cl close to your ear. That's their audio, the entire audio system. These are uh, very puny little <laughs> transducers. They'll be laughed at by anyone, forget about high-end audio. Uh, they'll, they'll be laughed at by anybody who cares tremendously about the audio qu quality. I haven't measured the frequency response, but I doubt very much it goes anywhere near 200 hertz or flat, so to speak. So it's, it's the, however, when you put them on and you uh, apply these spatial audio algorithms, the realism is uh, incre the, compared to a very expensive system. But realism is again, is a is a perceptual thing that, that uh, not aesthetic, but perceptual that there are actually techniques to, uh, uh, we can talk about later on, that we use in the laboratory to judge realism. Because it involves the brain, these are subjective techniques involved people testing. But you have to test many, many people for the data to be statistically meaningful. And there are techniques for, for doing that. But when you do those things, you, you find out that the if you uh, take care of spatial uh, accuracy, or if you increase the spatial accuracy of reproduction, it adds to realism far more than any other component. For example, these speakers are lousy frequency response. However, you can take really very cheap speakers and by doing by applying some of these ARVR audio algorithms we can talk about them you can produce a three-dimensional image the fact that the image is three-dimensional gives you a sensation of realism that anybody you put in if you put enough people and ask them to correct uh, the, the uh, some questions to answer according to these testing and to gauge the, re the uh, how realistic the perception is you'll find out it's far more <laughs> than if you take very expensive speakers and very well calibrated speakers and flat and um, and uh, neglect the spatial part, okay? So pretty much everybody in, in this field knows that the spatial part is tantamount, is a huge. Uh, 
Ironically, no one in the almost no one. When I go to the high end audio in Munich, there's very little about spatial audio. And and I, last time it was held was two years ago. I was there, and uh, very few com you can count them on your hand where people who are really uh, working on the spatial aspect of sound. So the past decades have been improving distortion and amplifiers, uh, mm -hmm. jitter in DACs, uh, higher resolution, uh, on and on. Cables, you mentioned cables and so on. There's a huge amount of ingenuity. I have so much respect for the engineers and high audio. I know quite a few of them. I know almost, you know, almost all the leading companies right now because of uh, my my venturing into the uh, the uh, industry of high end audio. Um, so I see there there's a tremendous engineering talent, tremendous ingenuity, but they're improving things that have shown uh, that no need to be improved much much further for realism. Or I should say the other way, they've been neglecting. The spatial aspect, with all the respect to my colleagues whom I admire a lot, uh, the spatial aspect is really very important. And I hope I can convince enough people. Uh, of course, some are convinced, and some really leading people are convinced. And you will see, you'll be seeing more and more in hi-fi and high-end audio uh, these transitions. Okay, and my hope is to build that, uh, help building those bridges. Now, uh, if one has to rank, and this is now treading on. Uh, subjective and controversial, although there is evidence from testing and from experience that if you rank, what are the elements that add to realism? Here's what we know from, from experience, from testing, from, from uh, uh, doing subjective testing and objective testing. Uh, and this is, uh, I will preface that by saying it's arguable. One can, can come and argue me uh, about the exact ranking. But the spatial aspect is by far number one. Okay, If you get it right, even with, with roll off this, you know, mess up this input response, even create distortion. <laughs> uh, the brain can be satisfied by a realism that's not there. And of course, you don't want to distort too much, you don't want, because that would detract from the realism. But nonetheless, that tells us that um, uh, realism is very important. Next, we'll ask, what's next? Okay, from the high, uh, what we know is uh, clarity. Clarity people, if something is not clear, they're bothered by it. Clarity, this is a general term, Translates in at least the closest thing it translates to scientifically is the impulse response of the transducer of, of the reproduction, meaning it's the time behavior. Okay, now a hundred dollar headphones, well designed, has far better impulse response than a hundred thousand dollar speakers. It's just a fact. And there are tests we can do where we can ask you, we can record the impulse response of the speakers, reproduce them very accurately with headphones to the point that you cannot distinguish that you're not, uh, and nobody can distinguish the difference between the reproduction and the headphones of the speakers and the speakers, okay? And that's a mm -hmm. test that uh, there's even a product on the market called uh, Smith Audio that does that. We have a product in a company called Theoretica that has a product called uh, Back HP that does that, but they, they can fool your brain. This is because the, the, the impulse response of the speakers is so accurate, or oh, the headphones, because there are, this is the laws of physics. You have been moving a very small transducer Inertia is very small, so you, you don't have that restoration uh, travel that you have when you disturb uh, you know, a transducer uh, because the transducer is very small. When it's big, it's going to have inertia, and it's going to smear, smear the response in time. So we get impulse response that's smeared in time. In other words, to use just a plain English, you are uh, spreading the energy of the sound over times but it's not supposed to be. And it's just being very sharp happening in time. It happens over successive times. So, so when you compare speakers to headphones, you right away realize um, that you, no speakers sound as clear as headphones. None. And unless the headphones are bad. But it's, I have a bunch of headphones behind me. This is my headphones lab next to my main lab. And there are more than 20 headphones. Any of them sounds better than it's more, uh, more clear. Okay? The clear. In terms, why? Because the Time response is not smear. So I would say the time response is comes next to spatial response. Now, everybody everybody in audio cares a lot about uh, frequency response. Frequency response to, turns out to be important if you want accuracy in reproduction and if you know what the actual reference is. Because if you take a violin, uh, Stradivarius, or you take a cheaper violin or a different violin, they sound different. Who are you? Unless if you know what the reference is, you don't know what you're producing. Okay, So there's always that unknown. But still... You can take a you can take a spatial you can take a very realistic um, uh, reproduction done with very good equipment and good ARVR spatial audio algorithms and play with the fixed response and you find out that you don't lose that realism. <laughs> so, from a point of view, pure feel, uh, the realistic impression the the impression that you're getting a realistic sound field 
spatial response is not, I mean, the frequency response is not as what's, what people think it's cracked up to be, what, what people have thought, uh, or, or including myself. Uh, of course, it's important because you want transparency uh, in terms of tonality, but it doesn't detract from realism nearly as much as the, as the clarity, and more important, not both of them, not nearly as much as the spatial reproduction. This is what we know. Now, there are other things on that list that people worry about in, in this hobby, and including, for example, things like uh, like a jitter, for example, uh, things like uh, the, the uh, uh, resolution, you know, the you know uh, bit rates and you know, sample rate. Now, the, uh, these also have been studied. They're very controversial in audio because people think, for example, uh, you can hear jitter. But we know from tests, you know, people can hear jitter up down to some level. Humans have a resolution, a time resolution that's as good, good down to a few microseconds. And of course, you have golden ears who claim they can do that. But when you do, when you do control testing, as done in universities using protocols that come from psychology department, where it's done for decades, and uh, if you do these, you'll find out that the claims um, are cannot be sustained. Of course, people that doesn't mean that people cannot. I'm not hearing this necessarily, but it cannot be sustained scientifically. So going to the picosecond jitter. It's an ingenious thing for an engineer to, to do on a DAC, and I respect that. Maybe people can hear it and can spend the money for it. That's great. It's a hobby. You're not hurting anyone. Go ahead and do it. But to claim that's going to add to the realism is it goes against all, all that we know about, about this realism. So um, um, so I'll summarize by saying, uh, and of course, there are other things. Uh, 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 resolution itself, and it's been a lot of tests on, on that, very controversial on the high-end audio, where very controlled tests are done for uh, resolution. I'm not going to give numbers because that will create all kinds of debates. But uh, I'm talking about sample rate. You'd be surprised uh, what the uh, what the impact on spatial uh, on, on realism is nowhere near uh, spatial realism. Um, and we can go down the list what people care about. We can talk about noise coming from your power supply and so on. Which what it's a hobby. People get fired up about this and love it. But that doesn't appear in that world where there are uh, these. PhD students who are love sound as much as we do, but they don't even own speakers. Literally, many of my my graduate students do not even own speakers. They listen to headphones. They don't know what a turntable is, but they're obsessed with sound and they're obsessed with this realism. And a lot of them are doing superb work, which I can talk about a little bit next. But I just want to summarize uh, from a high end audio and hi fi audio uh, what what lessons we can take from the ARVR world that the spatial aspect of sound reproduction is super important. It dwarfs uh, the, the other aspect to a large extent. So, Edgar, I got a question for you. In this new um, mindset, so to speak, of how we experience sound, how important is dynamics and volume level, or is that purely subjective? Oh, uh, by the way, they're, they're, they're important. Distortion is important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean the, the, the best, this is why I'm interested in bringing things from that world to hi-fi. I don't want to throw my, uh, all the great improvements done over the past 50, 60 years to producing these incredible speakers that people buy, including, you know, um, all the way from dynamic to uh, to static speakers to horns and so on. They're great invention and great uh, um, evolution. Um, but uh, dynamics is important, uh, and I'm, I, I didn't I didn't attempt to give a, a full list. By the way, distortion is important. Um, they have diff in, in terms of realism uh, again they are nowhere near spatial uh, production because people have done tests where for example i for a while i was after finding the cheapest speakers money could buy brand new okay and i finally found them about nine ten nine years ago or so uh, a student from my university undergraduate finished and opened a pop-up store where he sold everything made out of paper okay and uh he and it went to a store, it happened to have two brand new speakers for the four dollar and ninety-five cents. Okay. <laughs> and I took them and uh, they have the little cable with it terminated into a mini jack, put them on my iPhone. I designed what's called a crosstalk cancellation filter, which allows you to get binaural audio reproduced from speakers for a given distance from, from and and I played audio. Dynamic range is horrendous. The the um the uh, uh, the dynamics, so to speak, also are not well produced. Distortion galore, <laughs> and frequency response is so miserable you throw them. Okay, and for you know to listen to the news uh, on them, you, they will not even be sufficient enough. 
However, I played them to, to some number of well-known people in the audio industry, I won't, I won't name, and the smiles on their faces were tremendous. <laughs> that shows you. Another story was told to me by the artist Lori Anderson. Uh, she knows she has a friend called uh, Bob Bilecki, who, who brought a bunch of $1 speakers, I forgot how many of them, 30 of them or so, and recorded with a bunch of microphones, waves on the sea, and played it for her. And she's a very technical-minded artist who loves spatial audio and she understands. And she was in tears. She was so moved by the realism of the waves. The entire system maybe cost $20, okay? Um, so, so uh, um, and by the way, that particular technique of recording with multiple microphones and putting them on multiple speakers is, a, is one of the three main techniques. This is the simplest form of a technique called wave field synthesis. Now, Bob Bilecki, who did that, I'm not sure he was aware that he was doing wave field synthesis, but uh, the, uh, I'm going to talk about wave field synthesis. So, so I think what well, we should transition now, having hopefully convinced people, at least give them some food for thought that spatial audio is important. Um, of course, they can debate that, we can debate that, but trust me, that is the <laughs> consensus coming from the AR, the R world that I believe in and many people who work here believe in. The question then becomes, what are these magical techniques that can reproduce spatial audio correctly? And I have a few view graphs uh, on, on that. Is that uh, a good point to transition to that topic? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think that's good. And I think people will appreciate the slides at this point if, if you want to bring those up because you've got some pictures um, and, yeah. and uh, graphics that help to highlight this. I, I do, uh, maybe while you're getting yourself ready, I just want to mention you, you had talked about ways that you've shown folks um, done tests basically on things like transient response uh, uh, compared between headphones and speakers and you mentioned the idea that people can you can recreate the sound of the speaker through headphones and we've done some talks about that because it's something that of course done correctly means that you could provide people with virtual uh, listening experiences of different speakers they could hear what they sound like in a given room but actually your software because I, I I've seen demos of the software now um, can do something that's very neat and so for those that were hearing that just so you understand uh, basically you put these special microphones in your ears and you record the speaker uh, in a room and then when you listen to it his software allows you to listen to a musical piece through headphones naturally in other words just what the headphone is like with a potentially corrected response. And then you can flip it on and it can actually overlay the transfer function of the speaker itself with all of the impurities essentially of that speaker, including the way that it has corrupted the transient response. Um, am I saying this right, Edgar? Yes, yes. I, I, I would not use the word your software, even though I do have such a software. Um, and I want to stay as much into the realm of uh, here, putting my hat as a research and academic and not try to plug my products and because I do have well, a, there's a well, company. Plug so, away, Edgar. Plug away. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> but in but this I, case, I, it's I, just to explain. Way, I, I mentioned another company do. that does that beautifully, uh, Smith Audio. Uh, but this is technique used all over the world right now. You can measure the impulse response of speakers. And then if you know how to uh, equalize things correctly for headphones and how to do head tracking to compensate, we can talk about that later on if you want. We can talk about what it takes to do that trick correctly. And it's done in many laboratories. That happens to be my company, one of other companies that produce software that, can, that, that does this, but uh, it's not really my recipe, as, although the, we have a patent in this domain, but generally speaking, the technique of producing speakers on headphones is well established because we can, as you said, using microphones in your ear, measure accurately the response of speakers and in, uh, extract that response and use it to filter the sound uh, coming from direct audio, and your brain will get the same cues. As long as you keep things correctly, if you the headphones have to be transparent. The impedance between the transducer and the ear canal have to be low enough. Uh, you also have to do head tracking because humans, uh, when they rotate their head, uh, they are less full. Okay, so for example, if you put headphones on and you rotate your head, the, and let's say you have, a, you have a trumpet, the trumpet um, it will be right here at your ear if, if it's panned extreme right. If it's binaural, it can be outside your head, which is great. That's what we want. We talk about binaural. In a few minutes if you rotate your head the band however the trumpet will move with you now your brain knows that's not what happens in real life because if you go to a concert and rotate your head try it musicians refuse to stand up and rotate with you and, um, and therefore your brain knows that's not what happens in real reality so in order for that trick to work you also have to do head tracking uh, and that can be done in all kinds of software infrared or webcams can be can do it pretty accurately and then the image becomes fixed and that really is essential for uh, adding the last layer of robustness to the to the realism, but when you do all this, that's the punchline, is that your headphones can produce the speaker. 
that tells you the headphones are better from the impulse response for the new speakers. And if they have enough dynamic range, they can do it. So you can you feel like the walls are shaking. As a matter of fact, these people buy this, uh, those kind of products to go home and when their spouse uh, is sleeping, they can crank up the music and shake the walls and the speakers are dead. But they listen to their speakers. And you can make it so you're, it's pretty much indistinguishable. And we, we do those tests where you can take off the headphones and you cannot tell that the speakers are on or off. Uh, so it's um, th that tells you that um, you, know, you can fool the brain if you do things correctly. But now the main question is what are the ways to address spatial? And what do we know from that ARVR world that works uh, that uh, has now been applied to those uh, in gaming, in RVR? Uh, and in, in these telepresence uh, technologies and being improved on a daily basis and being discussed in, in these conferences. Um, you're not going to go to many conferences um, where you have 50 people, 50 young PhDs working on jitters and DAC. Trust me, I, don't, I haven't been to such a, a session. But you get to see many people around the world and now many companies from Google to Apple to Microsoft uh, to uh, Magic Leap and all these great companies are working and face, uh, Facebook and so on on spatial audio. Uh, literally hundreds of people at these companies are working trying to advance things because pretty soon it will penetrate the, the uh, well, for in, their, in their case, they're trying to uh, make products for realism uh, and communication. But I have no doubt that eventually these things will seep in and make our music experience at home better. And I'm, I'm, I hope to, to contribute to that, me and my, my colleagues. So now, to go back to what are the question, what are these techniques? Okay, there, so there are actually three techniques. Um, and I'll give the names first. And they have uh, one of them is called uh, wave field synthesis, I already mentioned. It's kind of a brute force way of uh, uh, recording sound, but there's an even more elegant way of doing it. And I'll, to get it to, to you in 3D, uh, to give you spatial realism. Another one goes by the fancy name of higher order ambisonics, uh, which goes back to the 1970s. And another one, which goes back even further than that, but perfected only much more recently, called binaural audio. Uh, and I'm going to, to summarize, there are three I'm going to talk about approaches, uh, wave synthesis, higher order ambisonics, and binaural audio. And the combination of binaural audio and higher order ambisonics is now standard in the, uh, in the uh, ARVR world and also in the gaming world to manipulate sound or first to reproduce sound spatial, spatially correctly, to navigate it and to manipulate it. So it's it's a very powerful tools have been created by combining the last two. So what are these three techniques? Before we, we get to talk about them, I just want to make introduction on what is 3D sound for those of you who haven't thought about it uh, uh, very much. Can you see my view graphs? Um, I'll pull them up right now. All right. So you can go ahead and make them uh, full screen okay. if you'd like. All right. So one question is, what is spatial audio? So um, spatial audio is reproducing using some transducers, not necessarily two, uh, for a human, the uh, perception that a sound source is in 3D space, not in the speakers, not, not in a, uh, and, 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 and if it's an actual, if it's based on reproducing a recorded signal, uh, one can define spatial audio as reproducing that bird where it was in 3D space. And if that bird moves, uh, give you the perception, the audio perception that, uh, that you get had you been in real life listening to the audio, to that uh, bird moving, okay? So that's what's, generally speaking, spatial audio in a, in a plain uh, English without going into technicalities. Another way to, to define spatial audio is to ask the question, what is not spatial audio? So if you are listening to a bird that's always locked uh, uh, at the speakers or near the speakers, and his motion is is locked to the speakers. So the only way you can change this motion is by putting the speakers apart some distance. That's not that's a, that's a hint that you're not having the spatial component done correctly. Now, um, surround sound, which was a wonderful invention uh, for a way to surround you with sound, as the correct as the correct word as the word implies, uh, is has been in, mostly invented for the film industry initially, at least, and still is the the realm of film industry and has become a standard in the film industry, uh, which is to put a number of speakers. There are all kinds of fancy way of panning. That's the standard uh, surround sound configuration you have at the home for a home theater by putting speakers in front of you and plus or minus 30 degrees and two surround speakers behind you. But that is not surround sound because, again, the bird is, as you said, uh, Matthew, earlier on, is going to be locked 
uh, more or less where the speakers are. And there are fancy ways of moving the speakers to, uh, and there are newer version of the surround sound, of course, implementation. I'm not going to name them and go through them. But they all are handicapped by the fact that they are not, uh, con they are constrained to put sound in some areas and not and not in other areas. For example, they cannot, as you said, put the sound in your uh, the bird in your ear. So for explosions, for helicopters in a movie, uh, to be surrounded by crowd noises, these are wonderful. But to have someone walk like this and whisper in your ear, that's spatial sound. <laughs> and uh, or to put a bee going around your head like this or a fly. Uh, that's the round sound. And the question is that can be how can that be done? Okay. And as I said, there are three methods: wave field synthesis, ambisonics, uh, especially a version of ambisonics called higher or ambisonics, which I will talk about briefly, and binaural slash XTC. XTC stands for crosstalk cancellation. When you use binaural over speakers, you have to use a technique called crosstalk cancellation, which I will describe briefly later on. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about these three methods. The first one I already mentioned. Uh, so if you have a point source, or you could have a wave on the ocean, but let's say a point source, it's intuitive that one way to get some spatial reproduction of that is to record it at multiple locations. So you see, these are microphones, and then we record the multiple channels on the recording, uh, in, in, on the recorder, typically a computer. And then the idea that you can play them back from a, a large number of speakers, large enough to reconstruct the same wave pattern that existed when the real source was there. You can then stand there and hear the bird. You hear the bird like this, right? That's what it was. And that is pretty much what uh, the gentleman called Bobby Lecky, whom Laurie Anderson told me about, did for her. He went to the ocean, put a bunch of microphones, took each signal, mapped it to a single speaker, put the speakers in front of her, cheap speakers. Dynamic range was not good. The dynam dynamics were not that good. I wasn't there, but I I'm presuming from the smallest of the speakers, uh, they must have rolled off at a few hundred hertz. N nonetheless, the, the realism of being on the beach was uncanny, as described by, by, uh, by the artist who was well-tuned to realism. So. What happens is there are, of course, more sophisticated way of doing this than just putting blood of microphones. It turns out that going back to the 19th century, there were some ingenious mathematicians and physicists who worked on this. The two, three most important names are the name of Kirchhoff, the name of Helmholtz, and the name of a French mathematician called Fresnel. So uh, the three have made contributions to the theory of uh, wave propagation, wave diffraction, and uh, wave refraction, uh, uh, I'm sorry, wave diffraction and uh, uh, wave reconstruction. And um, Helmholtz and Kirchhoff are German mathematicians who lived in the 19th century. Fresnel is a French, uh, uh, no, sorry, the physicist. So is Fresnel, who's, who's French. Um, there is a, there is a something called the um, the uh, Helmholtz uh, or the Kirchhoff-Fresnel uh, theorem, in, in in wave theory that we teach in, in classes. And there's something called the Helmholtz, uh, the Kirchhoff-Helmholtz uh, integral. What are they? Of course, we're not going to do math here, but what they do, they allow you, they, they say the following in plain English. I'm, I'm going to caricature what they say, but essentially that if you're able to record the sound, or not only the sound, any any wave field, but we're going we're gonna to concentrate on sound since we're talking about audio. But if you can record a sound uh, waves coming from instruments, from sound sources, by a series of microphones, how many microphones? Ideally, infinite number, but, uh, over a closed path. Uh, then this mathematics that they, they derived from first principles in physics allow you to reconstruct the sound field any point in space. Now, by any point in space, there's a footnote there. I'm not going to go through it, but caricaturing what they said, Again, if you record sound and multiple point space in where the microphones make a closed loop, it doesn't have to be a perfect circle as long as it's a closed loop. You can reconstruct the sound field outside that loop or in, even in principle in, in anywhere in 3D, in, in 3D space. Now, um, that theorem is very powerful. It's called Kirchhoff uh, uh, you know, uh, formula uh, integral of the Kirchhoff um, Fresnel uh, 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 
Kurt of Fresnel uh, theorem and the Kirchhoff of uh, uh, Helmholtz uh, integral, both of which are related, if you use them, you can do a better version of what uh, Bobby Lackey did for Laurie Anderson, which is to um, give a far more accurate reconstruction of, of uh, 3D space. And then you can also use better speakers than what he did. Uh, but here is a one implementation of wave field synthesis. You can see you can have them in a circle, or there could be arrays. I have been to uh, uh, RPI, where there's an incredible wave field synthesis system, huge, in a huge room with literally hundreds and hundreds of speakers. And there, it's kind of a, 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 a uh, um, almost a brute force uh, way, simple way to take many, many transducers, many microphones, and take the information from the microphones and use many speakers to reconstruct it. There are all kinds of issues and problems. The first one that jumps to you is the number of speakers, numbers of microphones. Of course, right away, this tells you that this is incompatible with an existing recording. So you have to record in a specific way with many, many microphones. Ideally, an infinite number of microphones and ideally an infinite number of speakers. Now, if you go to a finite one, as you have, you're have, you obliged to do in real life, you're going to have some issues. For example, if you use uh, speakers like this spaced a certain distance apart, you're going to get a problem called spatial aliasing. So when for wavelength that are shorter than the speaker distance, the sound field is not reproduced correctly. But that is the price you pay. On the other side, you can start reconstructing sound field. You can think of it as a hologram, an audio hologram. And that has been pursued, especially in Germany initially, but now in quite a few countries, Europe was uh, much more work has done been done in Europe on wave field synthesis than in, in the US, but now it's also been done in the US, but it's still a niche area in spatial audio because of the complexity involved. Okay? So that's all I have to do about, about wave field synthesis, but to summarize, it's a way to capture sound in multiple points, use the mathematics developed in the 19th century uh, in such a way to reconstruct that from from multiple transducers ideally a large number of them so before i go to the next one which is a more elegant way i should say uh which is called ambisonics i'll stop right here in case you have comments or, or questions uh edgar i don't think you want another question we're seeing yeah we got right some now. incredible <laughs> we got some incredible smart ass sarcasm <laughs> and nothing to do with your talk your talk is doing great it's they're just being goofy it's amazing but um i i just want to point out to everybody that that is the essence of what you're getting at here is that this first approach wave field synthesis is essentially like a brute force approach um yes, it relies on yeah i want to be careful with the word. i'm not being critical of it in the sense that it is a a, a in some ways it's, it's this beauty that it doesn't um uh, uh, need to do super processing to the sound. It is, a after all, a, a uh, reconstruction based on many, many spatial uh, sampling of a sound field. So in, it's an intuitive, maybe it's the most, one of the most intuitive way to do spatial sound. Right, absolutely. And I think the point you were making that I would want to reinforce is that this is a very effective approach to be used in a laboratory, but in a home, where we get into trying to reproduce this, it becomes impractical without a substantial change in how we put sound in rooms. And yes. it, it's so impractical that for people like Don, for instance, who's an integrator, uh, you know, we talk about wife acceptance factor. That's right. We have so a hard enough time putting two speakers in a room, let alone 160 speakers. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that, the WAF on this is very, very low, as, as you can tell. Um, so now, what is the second method? higher order ambisonics. Higher ambisonics turns out to be actually related mathematically to the same exact origin of wave field synthesis, which is the Helmholtz um, Fresnel uh, integral. I'm sorry, uh, 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 Kirchhoff Helmholtz uh, integral and that theorem that I mentioned earlier. Aside, however, a, it's a, a mathematician in, in Oxford in the 1970s by the name of Michael Gerzon, an ingenious mathematician who was an audiophile who wanted to do what I dream of, what I dream of, uh, and what everybody on this audio show, on, on this uh, streaming show, uh, dreams of, is to reproduce realistically sound, especially in their in the, in the in the room. And um, he went back to that same integral, but he did a beautifully elegant uh, manipulation of it to get you up to that theorem, to get it to work even better and to be easily coded. In other words, he realized that when you make a, a click like this. Um, sound propagates in a spherical wave. So spheres, the shape of a sphere is a natural 
uh, natural shape of, of, of waves when talking to, to sound, uh, talking about sound. So he used something called spherical harmonics. Now, what are harmonics? Oh, we all know what harmonics are for when you pluck a chord on a, uh, or a pluck a string on a guitar, you get the fundamental frequency, and then you get uh, other tones. These tones have to do with other um, vibration of the string, depending on the string uh, uh, material and length and, and how much is taught, uh, you will get modes that survive the, in, uh, the destructive interference that happens in a string as it vibrates. And these uh, are at, at uh, finite frequencies. Uh, and they are a lower amplitude than the fundamental. But if you sum them all, you get the sound of the string. So mathematically, there are sine waves. There are pure sounds, so to speak. So you can break any sound typically into these what's called Fourier components, which are called also uh, um, harmonics. Now, you can do the same thing for space. This is done in the, in the frequency domain or to a time to a time series into frequency domain, but you can do the same thing in space. And you can decompose the sound into components that are uh, the analog of these harmonics and uh, uh, the sine waves would be sm different shape spheres or almost, almost spheres that if you sum them all together, you can get back the sound field spatially. The, the key here is for spatially. How can that be done? Well, there's a microphone. There's one sitting behind me. I don't know if you can see it. Um, I can I can put it up so that you're the one that everybody sees. Give me a second. Yeah. There is one right behind me right here, which is also on the screen is better. But uh, that is uh, it's called a uh, higher order ambisonics microphone. This ha happened to be called the Eigen mic, uh, made by a company called MS Acoustics, about 20 minutes from uh, from from here uh, from me here in Princeton. Um, and there are other companies that do these now uh, that have many. Uh, capsules on them. So what what uh, Gerson did that said instead of recording the sound on a closed contour with microphones in a big space, if you put all the microphones on a sphere and measure the sound pressure, which microphones do in time over the surface of a sphere, then you can use the mathematical method of harmonics to represent the entire sound field, like you do in wave field synthesis based on the uh, Helmholtz Kirchhoff uh, integral, you can do the same ma mathematics, but now the mathematics are done for a sphere and everything is much more uh, beautifully mathematically set. In other words, everything is more compact and you end up breaking the sound, the space, the spatial representation of sound into what's called spherical harmonics. And they look like this. Now, for those of you who are not mathematically minded, this kind of looks like a beautiful thing you can put on your wall, maybe, but it looks like a sphere right here. And similarly with harmonics on the string, you get spatial different shapes of spheres when you put them together when you sum them together and the more you have of them the more you can get the better position of sound uh the more to get more of them you have not surprisingly to put more microphones uh there's a new version of this microphone that's coming out soon that has 64 microphones on it that's called a higher order as opposed to the the more microphones you have the more you can do a more accurate spatial reproduction with more harmonics so to speak with more spatial harmonics so what does that all mean? That means now we can do the same thing as wave synthesis, but you can do it in an elegant way. So you can record the sound field, any sound field with this microphone, and then by applying these uh, trans uh, mathematical transformations, once you decide where you can put the speakers anywhere you want, of course, there's a preferable place to put them when it's fear around you, but it doesn't have to be. Once you put them out there, there's a mathematical transformation that will act as a single processing to the input so that the output we construct the sound field in front of the speakers. So in some ways, it is wave field synthesis, but it's done using the elegant mathematics and the elegant representation uh, of, uh, of spherical harmonics, in, which has many other advantages I don't have the time to tell you, but the main advantage is that you have a very systematic way that is independent of the speakers. You can put them anywhere you want in principle. To, uh, but again, the more speakers, the better. And uh, uh, and it it allows again for creating what's essentially, ideally in an infinite when you talk to a very high order and very high number of speakers, a hologram of sound. You can potentially also navigate it. So that technique has many many advantages. Michael Gerson present did it in, in with the hope of doing it also for music listening at home. Except that, as you can imagine, it still requires many amplifiers, many speakers in the 70, many cables, and it stayed on the shelf. It almost died. 
except for a few curious people at university that kept it alive. Only the past decade, and literally, the, especially the past six, seven years, this has come to the forefront, to the point where now it is standard in ARVR. When you play uh, many games, the sound is designed with HOA. Uh, but HOA has many, many uses. Again, HOA is higher order ambisonics. And as far as our concern is, uh, our concern, um, uh, our interest here, it can be a very effective way to code a spatial sound field and then navigate it and then do something called beamforming, split it into many components. For example, about four years ago, five years ago, I think, four and a half years ago, I was invited by the person who records the symphonies at uh, Carnegie Hall, uh, Mr. Leszek Wojciak. And he came to my lab. He was excited about all this. And he kept me in mind. And one day he called me and said, Edgar, we have a very historic event at Carnegie Hall. We have 600 singers that are going to be for the first time in record in recent history on stage singing together. Choir, a grandiose choir. Some of it on stage, some of it for the round. And that was a great. So my graduate student and I packed half of the lab. We took it there. We hang one of these uh, microphones in, in, um, in Carnegie Hall and record the sound field of 600 singers. And we have been using this recording as a benchmark and as a, as a source to test all kinds of algorithms we, by using something called beamforming, which allows you, which, which, uh, which can be done with HOA. You can isolate literally a small group of even one single out of the 600. That's one, one of the magic things you can do. You can actually zoom in. Well, first, you can rotate the sound field in any theories of freedom. And also, you can navigate the sound field. However, navigation with a single microphone like this incurs some error as you depart from where the microphone was. So one application of this microphone, imagine recording an orchestra, or this, imagine you put that sound, uh, the microphone inside a, a, a hotel, uh, a, a restaurant, and then record that sound field. You can either in real time, sitting somewhere else, or, or with the recorded signal, navigate that sound field. You can say, I want to listen to the conversation at the bar, in principle, you can go there. However, as you navigate away from the point, you'll incur error. So there's a lot of research being done on how to minimize the error of navigation. And one of, one of the PhD students in my, in my uh, group got his PhD two years ago. His name is Joe Tilka, his PhD, and his, also resulted in a patent on how to do navigation with less error, which actually turns out to involve a more, more than one of these microphones. What is it, what does that do what is that? Why is that relevant to uh, music at home, uh, to high-end audio? It is very relevant when you combine it uh, with binaural audio, which is our next topic, uh, especially for for the music production side. Okay, it turns out that HOA is not needed for the reproduction at home very much at all, but however, it has is very powerful for people making content and engineers mixing sound. Ironically, it hasn't penetrated that, that, that world of pro audio yet. Some adventures pro audio engineers, one of them is Mark Mangini, who was an Oscar uh, winning uh, sound designer in LA, uh, did a lot of film, is fascinated by this technique and now is pioneering using HOA, there are other people, uh, for content creation. So, but however, it's important to mention because in principle, it, it can get you the sound field reproduction from speakers. But again, we have the the, uh, w, the wife of poor factor again. We have many speakers, so it's not really something ready or appropriate for home application on the reproduction side. Okay? However, one should mention it because it's very important as a lead to the third technique. And that third technique is called, we ask the question, is there a simpler, more elegant and natural method to record and play back a sound field? And, uh, to, to understand that method, I have to say a few things on how we hear in three dimension. And I suspect some of, if not many of the people listening already know some of these facts, but I, so I'll say them relatively quickly. But when you make a click like this in 3D space, or somebody makes a sound, the re, how can, um, how do human brain ear system locate that sound in 3D? It turns out that our brain ear system uses three types of cues. Mostly there are other cues, but these are the most dominant cues. The first one is called, goes by the name of ITD, stands for inter, uh, um, inter temp time difference or intertemporal difference. What is that? I have an illustration here that shows it. If somebody in a concert hall or anywhere sings or speaks, 
the time arrival of that those waves emitted by the singer at the right and left ear are different unless that person is right as in front of you so they arrive at two times your brain can detect the time difference then down to about 10 microseconds and then based on that time difference will bias your perception so if it arrives earlier on the right ear than the left ear your brain knows that it must the sound source must be on the right and your brain ear system is doing that all the time this is called itd the other one is even more intuitive and more clear to explain is that again the person on the right when the sound that gets to your right ear is going to be a bit louder than the left sound to the left ear and that's because it, first it travels a little bit longer but more importantly the head plays shadowing effect and the waves have to diffract around your head to reach your left ear so the amplitude of the left ear will be lower and your brain can detect these small differences between volume at your ear, ear canals uh, and the the uh, uh, the um, sound waves enter your ear canals and then can give you information on where the sound is coming from. We've perfected that uh, to locate sound uh, over, over our evolution because it's, it's uh, survival and to uh, save ourselves from predators and the proverbial bear in the forest. However, there is another kind of cues. Those of you who are physically minded can already guess that these cues can fail. If somebody is right in front of you, and makes a sound and if you ask someone what is the itd what's the inter is zero is that perfectly located in front of you and there's no time difference because the the is everything symmetric and you're looking straight at, at that source there's no itd similarly ild is zero because again because of the symmetry therefore your brain must be using other cues to locate the sound and we know that if you close our eyes you can and somebody's in front of you and going up and down, for example, you can tell that they're going up and down, even if your eyes closed. And that's because another kind of cues enter the picture, and these have to do with your, the pinna of your ear and also the shape of your head. As the sound wave start to diffract around your head, diffraction is when sound waves go around obstacles or, or objects, and enter your ear canal, they acquire certain coloration. This is the spectrum. This is the uh, decibel versus frequency. And... Um, for a sound wave, that's uh, for depending where its location at different degrees, up and down. And you can see it's radically different. If your amplifier has such a frequency response, you throw it in the garbage. But your, your ear is coloring the sound that much and with that differences, depending on its location. And your ear is different than Don's ear, than my ear. Unless you have two identical twins, uh, or you have an identical twin, uh, they're most people it's like a fingerprint the shape of the pinna the shape of the outer ear is so different that it results in this frequency a huge frequency uh, 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 spectra uh, differences in spectra that your brain which he hears as coloration interprets as location cues and in addition to itd and ild uses them to locate sound in 3d okay so that is how we hear in 3d there are other less important cues that uh, happen i'm not going to mention them right now but just to summarize to understand uh, how we locate sound in 3d we have to understand that we have to produce itd ild and spectral cues or they have to give the brain ear system those cues and only then you have some sense of accuracy okay. now i want to um so how do we use that those facts that we know from sound perception sound perception to um reproduce sound from speakers in a home, for example. Well, the technique of, of uh, measuring the sound field with only two microphones, but instead of just two microphones in space, implant the microphones inside the dummy head. And that technique goes back to uh, the earliest days of, of, of uh, stereoscopy, the idea of 3D imaging. Um, let me explain, okay? so. Back in the 1830s, uh, when photography was being uh, invented, people start thinking, how can we have 3D imaging? How can we see a picture in 3D? And we'll see that this, this solution is a perfect analog to getting binaural audio to work, okay? Um, so what did they do? Well, um, 
Wheatstone is a, is a gentleman, invent, English inventor, who cracked this problem even a few years before the invention of photography. He happened to be a very good draftsman, so he closed his left ear, made a drawing uh, with his right ear. I'm sorry, closed his left eye, <laughs> made a drawing with his right eye, and then closed his right eye, made the same drawing of the same scene from, from the perspective of one eye or uh, uh, only the other eye. So he has two drawings, slightly different because from different uh, vantage points. He put them in front of him, and he realized he doesn't see in 3D yet. He put lenses, and he still couldn't see in, uh, to, to focus the eye more or less on the images. He couldn't see 3D until he added that little wall that you see here between them, that little wall right here. That wall is essential for 3D imaging. And in audio, there's an exactly the same analog called the crosstalk canceller. Why is that called crosstalk canceller? The wall's function is to stop the left image from being seen by the right eye and the right image from being seen by the left eye to block that crosstalk. It should be called cross sight here, but in audio we call it crosstalk. Once he put that little thing, bang, he saw in 3D. And I'm sure everybody has seen one of these at garage sales and antique stores. And they are exactly the same technology used in 3D cinema, except instead of having a wooden lens, a wooden holder and lens like this, you have more sophisticated polarized glasses. But you have a camera that record these images as, as, a, as a, instead of doing them by hand. So that's going to take us to the realm of audio by looking at this analogy. So to do stereoscopy, starting from the 1830s, people knew that you only have to do take a camera with two lenses, where the distance between the two lenses is the interocular distance, the dis typical distance between two eyes. And then when you play it back, present the two images to the two eyes, make sure that the left eye doesn't see the right image, and the right image to see the, uh, the the left one. In other words, do crosstalk cancellation, and bang, your ear, your uh, eye, brain system will have all the cues to see an image in 3D. And all of you have experienced that. It turns out that in audio, there's a perfect analog. To do 3D audio with binaural technique, you take a dummy head, and you put two microphones in the ear, exactly the same way in the analog of uh, of video or photography. You use two two lenses. The distance between them is the eye distance. You emulate the two vantage points here with two vantage points for the audio, which are the ears. So inside the ears of this dummy head, there are microphones. There's a dummy head behind me with such microphones. Now, if you take these two microphones signal, stereo, you play it back. And I'm going to show you here uh, and put a wall between these two speakers. You will get your ear roughly. Uh, left ear, if you isolate your left ear from hearing the right speaker by putting a barrier, which is equivalent to that cross side canceller, you'll be surprised what you hear. You'll hear a pretty 3D image. As a matter of fact, anybody listening to, to, to this show can do this experiment at home. Take two speakers, put them in front of you, play any record stereo acoustically, ideally, and better if you can find binaural audio by do, going to YouTube, put the word binaural, a lot of stuff is recorded with dummy heads. Play it from two speakers. And, and before you play it, put a mattress between the two speakers and have it come to your head. Now, you have to do that when your spouse is not at home. But if you can do that and um, with the mattress, you'll be very surprised. You'll hear pretty much like what this picture does. Put two microphones in the ear first, record something, which is by no recording. And then when you record it, you're capturing the sound waves at these microphones. That's called a binaural recording. And then you play it back from speakers. If you don't do crosstalk cancellation, you will hear a phantom image that is uh, locked into the right speaker in this case because the uh, the listener was far to the right. But if you then, uh, if you kill the crosstalk by putting a barrier, without the crosstalk uh, cancellation, the singer or the speaker would be stuck to the right speaker, which is not where he was or she was in real life. But if you put a filter, uh, if you put a barrier, which we can now go and go to filter, you will actually get a 3D image. And you'll be surprised how much more realistic that sound will become. Okay, so I'm going to stop right here by summarizing that one way to get a stereo image to be spatially more correct and more realistic is, especially if it's recorded acoustically, 
we're going to talk initially of course acoustically with two microphones and a dummy head then if you put a barrier between the two speakers and only then when you stop the left speaker from being mostly heard by the uh, by the right ear or at least attenuated with respect to the left ear and vice versa you will get a 3d image and there is a recipe that can be refined and done electronically with digital filters so you don't have to use a mattress in order to get 3d sound to come out of two speakers and it's called crosstalk cancellation and um we can talk about this implementation and how far it has has come but that summarizes the three techniques this happens to be the one that's most uh, was advantage uh, the advantage about it that it's it works with uh, uh first with any uh, with the it only requires two channels as a stereo compatible and it turns out that all existing recording acoustic recordings at least contain itd or ild cues that this method will allow you to transmit correctly to this to the to the listener therefore acoustic recordings if you do cross talk cancellation on them will naturally become more three-dimensional and more spatial in a striking way actually and what we can do with the mattress we can now do with processing by creating digital filters that manipulate the sound pressure the right left speaker in such a way to cancel each other at the cancel the right speaker pressure at the left ear and vice versa to do it correctly without affecting sound uh, the sound quality you have to design these filters in a very specific way and there have been a few breakthroughs over the past uh, five to ten years that allow to do that combined with head tracking because you need to know what the head is you can produce a very striking 3d image from two speakers this happens to be out of the three techniques the one that's most transferable and most compatible with home listening because it requires two speakers we only have two ears we have all the information you need and then it, it, you can add this processor in a stage in your DAC or and then you end up with Costa cancellation enhancing this the spatial imaging tremendously now the question I'm sure somebody's going to ask this is all, all sounds good if you have binaural recording what about if you do if you have regular stereo recordings how would that work or another question very important that sounds fine for binaural recording or maybe even stereo recording acoustical uh, acoustically made but how about pop music or folk music that's recorded with in studio constructed artificially so to speak does that can that technique offer any advantage the short answer is yes very much so but it needs to be explained but i'm going to stop right here again because that's the again the break point for reviewing the three most important to, to summarize wave field synthesis requires many speakers many microphones higher order abisonics requires many capsules on one sphere but it still requires many speakers uh incompatible with existing recording but offers the a lot of advantages for sound field navigation for beam formation for content manipulation uh, for for many things especially on the content side not very practical for the home unless if it's combined with this technique but this technique by itself called binaural cross talk cancellation binaural audio and cross talk cancellation is by far the most relevant so that the first bridge that i was involved in from taking techniques that are very bad for arvr to the world of hi-fi was cross talk cancellation um, now i'm sure there can be questions how is that done how can we do it at home we can talk about it. but this is the theory this is the principles behind these three techniques and the last one is the most interesting and the most relevant for for hi-fi listening i know this has been long-winded but that is uh, a, a a best summary i could do of the state of the art of the of, of the essence of these three approaches which are now the main approaches for spatial audio are any major manufacturers interested in bringing this technology out here anytime soon and if so will our speak existing speaker systems be backwards compatible yes the nice thing is that speaker systems are uh, perfectly fine the better the speaker of course now we go back to your question if your speaker can play stereoistic uh, sound pressure level at the ears without distortion all the better it will add to the realism and they can produce a big uh, a lot of dynamics it's all the better everything will add to the realism uh, but to answer your question there is more and more and of course since i involved in this particular cross talk cancellation effort cross talk cancellation effort i should say existed since 1961 okay in the lab however it was flawed by tremendous coloration to the sound to the point that it will be of no interest to anybody listening to that show, 
show. It distorted the tonal content so much, especially the central image, that it's unacceptable. If one of the uh, one of the cont uh, contributions that my group has done was to find a way to do cross talk cancellation with completely flat frequency response, zero uh, coloration. Only then it became relevant to hi-fi listening. So I was um, I was um, encouraged by that. To uh, my university encouraged me to form a startup company that uh, allowed me to take that to the hi-fi world, where now we have software, and I'm not going to. You know, talk too much about it. it can be explored on the web by a company called Theoretica.us. But there's software and hardware that allow to do that. And there's another company that's licensing this to other manufacturers. And I, I have, I can tell you, there will be more product coming soon. From I know from the licensing company called Bach Labs is licensing right now the technologies to some high-end manufacturer, including a very highly respected speaker manufacturer. Will just sign a license. I cannot disclose that. But there will be more. And other companies are working on cross-talk cancellation, not only us. We think we have, a, 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 at least the Erica, the company that's spun up from my university, thinks it has a patents that protect them, you know, uh, uh, the, the purest way of doing it. But that's, that is uh, something to be decided by critics. The bottom line, to answer your question, there'll be more of that. As a matter of fact, that is one of the first areas in spatial audio that has some penetration in the hi-fi world. And I predict there will be a lot more uh, in the next few years. So, Matt, we should probably try to get one of these uh, systems set up in the Audioholic smart home. Uh, well, not exactly. We will get something set up. You will get to demo <laughs> it. But um, don't worry about that. Uh, it's, a, it's a little complicated to, to have it just set up in the smart home, but we can definitely set it up so that, that you can demo it and Gene can demo it and we'll definitely have others uh, checking it out. Um, and there is, I mean, I think people should, if they want to, they can check out the company that Edgar's talking about. There is some hardware that's available. Um, you know, I think my dream. I, think I should also mention there, the hardware can be very expensive because it's had made to exacting yeah. standards, but however, this, there's software uh, that can allow to, to, to do this. There are also uh, approximation of the software by other manufacturers. But the uh, the box software, so to speak, uh, is probably the most affordable option if you want to experience that. But no, yeah, so I just in parenthesis that it's not only hardware. Yeah, that's correct. And um, I just wanted to mention my dream has been that, and there's no reason why this can't be done, that essentially your technology aggregate would get end up in, in everyday common receivers, for instance, yeah. in people's homes because uh, at the end of the day, as you've mentioned, the DSP uh, processing that's used for this can work with any speaker. It's uh, essentially speaker agnostic, and while there are certain characteristics that uh, of the speakers in the room that help it to work better, um, it will work with any speaker. And so if you were to throw it in your average Denon or Marantz or Yamaha receiver, everybody could experience this potentially. Um, so, so that's been my dream, but I know we're not quite there yet. Yes, and I should also put some caveats there. Uh, yes, it does work with all speakers. Speakers have different directivity patterns. Some are more directed than others, and we can talk about that in another conversation. We've done a lot of work on directivity. It turns out that for uh, the special techniques to work, all of them, especially this one, you need to be listening to your speakers, not to your walls reflection. So the, you need to get direct sound to dominate over reflection, over uh, reflection. So the ratio of direct to reflected sound has to be made high. So if you have regular speakers, which are uh, radiate mostly omnidirectionally, um, you need to make sure that you're listening directly to them. So either you sit in relatively in the near field or you treat the wall, only the audio reflections to make sure they don't interfere because these will de degrade the crosstalk cancellation and therefore de degrade the 3D imaging. Uh, but any speaker, and you, you can, so you can address this raising the ratio of direct to reflected sound in three ways. Uh, either listening in, in the uh, near field and or using directives, more directive speakers their autotelic speakers are very directive, horn are more directive, and so on. And or treating the room, but only the audio reflections need to be treated. If you do any of the three or combination of the three, you can easily get high level of cross cancellation in, in a typical listening room and get a stereo recordings to bloom in 3D, including concocted. Uh, 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 we haven't discussed yet. I'm not sure we have time. And I'm sure this is going to be a question in people's mind. Yes, how does this work with regular uh, stereo recording? The short answer is, Pretty much any stereo recording contains either ILD or ITD cues. The binaural recording contain ILD, ITD, and spectrocular, all three, so they give you the most accurate 3D imaging. But any stereo recording, if you take two microphones 
on the microphones, put them in a hall to record uh, that's how most orchestras are recorded. That records the ITD. And if you, without the crosstalk cancellation, the ITD will be corrupted and the image will be compacted into the two speakers as a phantom image. You won't get the reverb correctly at all. And that's why uh, in audio file rooms are not, uh, people advise them not to make them too dead because you need to get some envelopment and you don't have the envelopment uh, coming from the, from the speakers. So you use the walls. But if you do this technique, you'll be hearing the reverb in the recording. And the, uh, so you don't need, you don't need to uh, have a live room. As a matter of fact, you, don't, you, you need to decrease the reflections. So there are some things you have to, to uh, speak correctly. But yes, it's very compatible uh, with, uh, so we know many people who are using these technologies that have systems varying from tiny little bookshelf speakers to huge speakers, uh, all of which give, um, uh, are, uh, give 3D imaging that's significantly enhanced without crosstalk cancellation. So crosstalk cancellation is literally a removal of an artifice that shouldn't be there during playback. During recording, you need to, cross, to capture the crosstalk, which is the ILD, ITD that happens at the microphones. But when you play back, you need the crosstalk is by definition something you don't need. Um, and you it's need a to kind of distortion, it. basically. Yes, it's, it's the exact. Imagine every single movie since 1957. 1957 is when, around 57, when the first time you can buy stereo recordings. And now you can take any all these stereo recordings and print them through crosstalk cancellation. and Invariably, you're going to get, if you get, uh, the, if you listen to high uh, directly reflected sound, you're going to hear a 3D image. And imagine, you know, the fun of re exploring all that. It's exactly like, imagine that every movie since the earliest movies were shot with the stereoscopic camera, but we have been watching them without the glasses, without the stereoscopic glasses. So, crosstalk cancellation is exactly the same analog. You are putting the, the uh, crosstalk cancellation glasses. Which is that they're doing crosstalk cancellations? What, what the glasses do, and suddenly you hear a you see a three D image, and uh, that is exactly what crosstalk cancellation does to the sound. So having all these recordings since nineteen fifty seven is like having so many movies shot in three D, and for the first time you can you can watch them in three D because finally you have the glasses. Let me show you something else. I don't like three D uh, cinema. It's tiring for for me. Many people get dizzy and sick. Here, and with audio, it's the opposite. Because you're not anymore listening to phantom images between two speakers, which your brain does not believe is real, <laughs> and working to, to, to relax. When you have a, a spatial image that's, uh, that approaches the realism of, uh, of the uh, original soundstage, it can come very close, uh, your brain relaxes because it believes it's, it's, a sound, it's a sound field. And one of the only complaints that we've heard from uh, people who use this kind of technologies, a correct spatial audio, not only this, but any spatial audio, is that you can send, spend too much time listening to music because it, it becomes a relax, a truly relaxing experience because your brain is sat, being satisfied by receiving the ITD, ILD, Q, the spectral cues correctly and not working to protect you subconsciously from a danger of a phantom image because that's how, that's not a natural thing that occurs. I'm using the word danger here in, in, in allegorical terms between quotes. Okay, so that's my long-winded answer to the question of what, what if that can be experienced at home. Well, What's and I think that's great. We've definitely gone uh, past our hour. I'm just looking to see if we have any comments or questions we should bring up. I'm not seeing anything. I think you've really actually answered most of the questions that had come in in uh, the course of the talk. So uh, I just want to say, Edgar, again, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, I know it's been a long time coming. You and I have actually been talking, I think, for a few months now at least. Um, about this topic and, and uh, I was excited to get you on. So I'm glad we were able to do this. We're gonna have you back for sure. We need to have you back because this topic is too big. Uh, you've basically just touched upon the theoretical aspects of how this works, a uh, brief overview of the technology itself, but I think we need to have you come back and actually talk a bit more about the, the technology itself um, that, uh, that you've developed. I think you, you mentioned something that folks are gonna, I think we should probably talk about the history of crosstalk cancellation maybe in our next talk a bit because you mentioned something and I think a lot of our listeners are gonna be familiar with those efforts in the 80s and 90s to introduce crosstalk cancellation filters that were really effective and not effective at the same time. You know, as you mentioned, they were colored and a lot of people would turn them on and say, well, it's more 
spatial, I guess. Like I'm hearing something more, but it sounds awful. And they turned it off and, and they didn't use it. There was the Carver system, uh, Carver hol holography, I think it was called something like that. I have one here in my lab, so uh, yeah. it's a relic. Yes, of course. Yeah, yes, there were so there were systems like that. People yeah. are going to know that there's also the poke system, the SDA technology that was uh, actually brought up in the comments. And I, I have the poke L800s, which is the newest iteration of that that they uh, had let me review. And, and and you know, you and I have talked about that. I mean, they've gotten good at reducing the coloration, but the coloration is there. I measured it. I heard it. Everybody who's reviewed it has brought it up. And on top of that, the crosstalk cancellation in all of these systems is actually not all that high either. Uh, which creates its own issues. Whereas the system that you had developed um, provides a very high amount of crosstalk cancellation and as you mentioned, no coloration. And so that's a big change. I think one of the reasons why this technology was not viable in the past and died out was that it was coloring the sound to the point of unlistenability and it actually wasn't providing enough crosstalk to be as effective as it needed to be. And we needed advancements, which we have now. Yeah, I mean, we can touch on all that in the future. Yes, exactly. We can talk about the differences, the evolution, what has been solved. Uh, the head tracking we haven't talked about much at all is central right. again to get the image uh, again to be to be realistic and the sweet spot to be enlarged. Um, today, I just wanted to give a background on spatial audio, try to uh, instill that, that uh, if not the conviction in some people, but at least let them scratch their head with the fact that there are many people out there who believe spatial audio is essential. And there, that belief hasn't penetrated much in that industry, uh, not even in the pro audio industry. Uh, but there's a lot to talk about, and I'm happy to join again and talk about not only the imputation of uh, my, te well, my technology, but in general also uh, what how these tools can be used in content creation in the future. How can the the experience of spatial audio, um, how can the, the spatial audio tools increase the realism at home? So uh, the idea of uh, fooling the brain, which is now is regularly done in many areas of AR, VR, um, can be really done for, for the goal of uh, music enjoyment. And we're not any, we're not very far from that uh, ideal as much, especially if you put attention to, to this. So if many engineers from uh, uh, the world of high-end uh, high audio start contributing to creating components and more and more are, taking these, sp these spatial audio uh, algorithms and, and, and tools from AR, VR, you can see tremendous evolution quicker than ever happened in the past 50, 60 years, I think. And that's what I'm hoping would happen soon. Well, I don't know, man. I think probably uh, better power cords and those little stands you put your speaker wire on, that's the future <laughs> of high-end audio, not this. I you, hope you you're wrong. I get to talk about this, Don, so <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will not talk about this topic. <laughs> I'll digress. <laughs> Yeah. So, all right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to suggest we bring this talk to an end. I think I'm amazed that people have stuck with us for this long. We've been going for thank about you. 90 minutes. It looks like, and we still got 57 people on. So I want to thank everybody for joining us Appreciate tonight. It. Edgar, again, I want to thank you for joining us and absolutely we'll have you back. So thank you. And Don, help me bring us uh, to a close here. What do we say until next time? Until next time. Keep, keep listening. listening. Thank you all. Thanks for having me. <laughs>